longer to move through your career, you have to have some skills and capabilities and be able, not just to be able to do things, but actually demonstrate to other people that you can do them. Um, and ideally, you have some experience of doing them as well. Let's not forget the experience bit. Um, and very often, um, really interesting kind of looking from a recruitment perspective, you know, we have this very open-ended question about, well, what can you do, you know, and, and what kind of, what are you able to do? And organizations, when they kind of advertise for pay more people, um, it's a kind of, it's often, is kind of such a multitude of things that we might possibly do within a PMO. Sometimes it's very difficult to narrow it down. In our sister company, we actually did some research. Over the last four years, we've collected information and we went out and asked people who work in PMOs at all different levels, well, what is it you actually do? Yes, and, and, and what I want is a nice little one sentence that I can tell my mother that she'll go, ah, right now I understand daily, but we, we never quite managed to get there. But what we have got is we produced quite a detailed list of, pe of things that people actually did on a day-to-day -day basis in their day job in a PMO. And because we don't just kind of take one particular reference, we also went and had a look at a couple of other uh, pieces of work that had been undertaken um, recently and some a little bit uh, further away. Um, anybody got the P3 O certification or the P3 O manual? Yes? We all know about the wonderful Appendix F. Yes? People know about Appendix F? Worth buying the manual just for Appendix F. So Appendix F lists all of the functions and services that we may possibly provide from a PMO. I say all of the services. It's got about 20 pages in there. It's certainly enough to keep us going in, in the meantime. So it has all of these list of functions and services, which aligned with our thinking, what we've got is kind of how much of it people do rather than, than other aspects. We also went back to some work that was done by Monique Aubrey, um, a, a number of years ago when she did some initial research into PMOs and what PMO does and she came up with kind of key, the key 23 services and the interesting thing is nothing much changed over the years. So we are relatively confident now that we've got a, quite a good picture of what people actually do in PMOs and effectively it really kind of separates into two dollops, technical phrase, two dollops of kind of competencies. So the first one is all about setting up, running, transforming, and closing down a PMO. And I know we don't like closing down PMOs, but think of it in a positive light. At the end of a project, and you've had a project PMO, the right thing to do is to shut that PMO down, yes, and take the stuff back into the business. You're only going to set up another one for the next project, but closing a PMO down is definitely part of the PMO's job. But a closing PMO is definitely part of our skill set. And typically, PMO managers are the type of people who do that type of thing. The other set of kind of skills capabilities that we need are all related to the services that we provide as a PMO. So whether that be from risk management from keeping a risk register on behalf of a project manager, whether it's facilitating strategy development and the, port the change portfolio for the next three to five years of your organization, and almost anything and everything in between that. So what we, what we identified is the, those two great, uh, the two main aspects of the work that we do. One of the things that we also recognize is that as well as doing that, we have to do lots of other standard management type activities. Yes, we have to do kind of staff development. We have to do coaching of individuals. So what we did is we said what we're looking at specifically is things that you do because you're a PMO specialist, not generic management activities, not generic management behaviors, not industry or um, sector specialism. This is kind of things that we do in a PMO. And one of the things that we said is, well, if we, if we have to do all of those things, how good do we need to be at each of those various elements? Because the fact that I can do reporting, the fact that I can do coaching, 
the fact that I can do risk management, how do I actually work out how good I actually am and how good I actually need to be? So we went and we've done some research among a number of various kind of competency frameworks. And what we've done is we've said, well, actually, we can think about this in four different levels. So down at level one, we're really talking about doing things highly supervised in a, in a way that um, is to some particular standard, following a defined process, using some templates that are already there in the organization. Right up to at the higher level, and there's five different dimensions, and I wrote them down because I can never remember them. But as we go up through the different levels, there's five things that we see tend to increase. One is the level of proactivity, yes? So we start to initiate change and improvement and the way things are done as we move it from level one to level four. The level of complexity of the uh, projects, programs, services that we provide increases as we move from level one to four. The time frame that we work under, so we no longer kind of, you know, we don't just do a service that's like 15 minutes on a Monday morning when we collect the time sheeting information. Yes, we tend to do things that are, a, a lapse over a period of time and the service develops and, and improves. We also, as we move from level one to level four, have to increase the level of influence we have not just people who we work with, but people who are delivering projects and programs. Uh, and kind of up at kind of level three, what we're seeing is we're starting to influence across our organization. And quite interestingly, at level four, we're actually starting to influence the industry. Yes? So if I am kind of really, you know, very, very good on risk management, at level three, I may be kind of starting to set the risk management strategy across the organization. At level four, I would expect me to be into some practitioner groups that go across the industry that are really starting to expand the thinking about risk management and how it can be applied, developing some kind of new tools that we can work along. So we, we need everything in between. The, the final element that increases between level one and level four is autonomy. So we get less and less supervision and we're actually starting to decide on what needs to be done and kind of driving that and suggesting and, and the greater level of influence starts in actually we're not de delivering these services but actually we're changing what that service looks like so it is more value adding and it may be a little bit more challenging for the organization to kind of to work with but actually adds greater amount of value. So we've defined those four different levels. So we talk, we've talked through what it is we need to do. We've talked about kind of what the different levels are. And when we started working um, um, with our sister company, the Flash Mob, to start pulling together a competency framework, specifically for PMO individuals, to look specifically at the skills and capabilities they need, what became really obvious is that we couldn't just have a single set of levels between one and four for something like risk management or reporting, yes? we needed to go into a little bit more detail. So what we uh, designed, and, and hopefully that kind of comes up there, is that where you work and the context within which you apply that competence becomes absolutely important. So I can, at level one, she says hopefully this, at level one, in a I'm trying to order in a project office. You may not be able to read this, but you will have access to it from the PMO Flash Mob website when it comes through. At level one at a project office, I may be sitting there using a risk log template, and I'm literally taking notes at the project meeting and writing them in. Okay? So, and I can get really good at that, so I can actually start, you know, if I'm sitting at level two and level three, I'm actually starting to say, well, actually, it would be much better if we had these few additional fields on our, on our risk log. Yes, we get some more information. So I get about developing that. But actually, it becomes a slightly different kettle of fish. Oh, wrong one, sorry. Pause back, jump lots. If I'm actually sitting in a program office, because now, with a program office, not only 
have I got individual project risks that I'm recording? I need to start spotting trends and how some of those need to be escalated up into a program risk. So we still have levels one to four, but then we do slightly different things and we, we measure what good looks like differently at a program office than at a project office. And again, once we get to a portfolio office, it becomes a really interesting aspect at a portfolio office because not only do we see escalated risks from projects and programs, we're now starting to see portfolio risks and starting to have an understanding of how that combines with the business risks to the organization. So again, we have levels one to four, but if I'm sitting in a portfolio office, they look very different to what it would look like at a project office. And we, we did um, have lots of conversations about whether we wanted to have center of excellence. Do organizations still actually have standalone center of excellence offices? And we said, well, even if they don't, even if it's combined within another PMO, there are still center of excellence activities about designing the process and rolling that process out. So there are different sets of levels between one and four for if you're, you're working and doing center of excellence type activities. So we've taken all of the individual competencies, all of the things that people need to be able to do as a PMO person. We're working through the four different levels and we're starting to identify, well, what does good look like for each of those levels in each of the various contexts? Does that sound useful? So what we're, we're looking to do is we're, we're, we're looking to get the first draft of this out uh, further in the year. And, and the, we've done it, people say, well, who are you doing this for? And we've done it for a number of, of, of reasons. And primarily, it's to help individuals to start looking at, well, actually, how can I describe in a meaningful way what I do and how competent am I at doing that particular service or managing a PMO? So one of the functionalities that we can be able to do is we can actually use the competency framework and think, well, actually, do I support projects? Do I support programs? Do I support portfolios? Or am I doing center of excellence and standard setting for the organization? And if I think about that particular context, well, actually, what level am I at? Level one, two, three, or four? So we can do some self-assessment to start identifying where we are and potentially where I would like to be in terms of where my development is going. Yes, and this is the first commercial, we're doing it as open source from the flash mob. It's the first time that's going to be available for a PMO. So there are a couple of organizations who've kind of done bits of this work, but this is the first time a wholesale approach has been taken specifically for PMO individuals. So that hopefully helps us getting to a position where not only do we kind of understand it, it, it hopefully it represents you, but we will find in there things that you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis and be able to assess where you are in that kind of skills ladder. Um, one of the things that uh, we've also looked at is where the kind of the various development is and, and how do I actually kind of move forward and increase my capability in order to kind of work through my career. And certainly one of the... Um, one of the aspects we've looked at is kind of these levels of training. And it, one of the challenges we had when we were talking about doing the different levels in the competency framework was whether we wanted to have names for levels. So did we want an introductory level? Did we want a practitioner level? And we said, actually, it's too confusing because the certifications that are out there, not just in PMO, but in project management, the kind of what's a pra what is a practitioner and what is a foundation level really depends on the certification that you're going for. So we kind of took a step back from that and lived with our kind of levels one to four. When we kind of look more generically kind of across all of the, those kind of competencies, really kind of when, when people are talking about coming in at level one, it really is about a support level. And, I, and it's quite interesting, having been involved with the P3, when the P3 manual was first written, there was a lot of uh, thinking that uh, PMO was an administrative function. 
yes. And the word support was banished from the first version. We did have the sense to put it in, in again for the second one because we didn't want people to think we were just there as administrators. The world has kind of definitely moved on from that, but there is still a role uh, to support projects and, and programs. And certainly one of the, one of the courses uh, we're, we're working on is, is how to take minutes at a project meeting, yes? That level of support is actually kind of still required. So level one is really about new to kind of being in a support function. So you may know a bit about project and program management, but actually it's about building up and saying, right then, so how best can I facilitate the kind of the project and program manager actually being successful in their role? How can I provide the organization with the information they need to make decisions? So it's really working at that support level. As we move up to level two, it's really about not just individual services, but it's actually kind of looking at a broader support for projects and programs. So there'll be more integrated services, there will be a greater level of um, development, and one of the things we talk about in P3O is this difference between doing supportive services, yes, and actually doing some of the more assurance roles about actually kind of validating and ensuring that things are being done as they need to do. So there's one thing about running and supporting a project manager by holding their risk register and checking the actions are up to date. There's another thing altogether that's saying, by the way, this mitigation that you've got down here isn't actually having an impact on the risk. So actually we're going to need to some additional mitigations put in place in order to address this risk. So it turns into a kind of a different relationship. When we get into level three, what we're talking about is actually doing some PMO management. And we've already mentioned that PMOs come in lots of different shapes and sizes, yes? Uh, very often, uh, we have, uh, and we always use this term when we try and get up here, we have this concept of a poo. Yes, a project office of one. Yes, aptly names because that's what it feels like sometimes when you're a project office of one. Uh, often we have project office of twos, we have some pots, but sometimes that, and that is the absolute right size for a PMO. So, uh, sometimes, and it was really interesting, we, we had somebody recently who was talking about a PMO with 110 people in. Who wants to work in a PMO with 110 people in? Yes, who would dream of just having five in their PMO? But level three is about managing a PMO. And, and, and there's a slight change then in emphasis. It's not just about providing services out to your customers. It's actually about designing the right PMO for that particular set of customers and making sure the services are the right services for those particular customers. And when we get to level four, we, we tend to be talking about not just managing one PMO, but actually managing the whole PMO provision across an organization. So your P3 or your, your whole kind of design structure for that organization. Uh, and is a kind of a very different beast to actually running an individual uh, PMO. So those are the kind of the four levels that we're starting to look at. So once we've identified and been through the competencies, we've worked out kind of where we are in terms of level, starting to think about, well, actually, how do I develop myself further so I can actually start kind of consolidating the knowledge that I have, getting some more experience, but actually learning about what else is out there in terms of moving up to the next levels. So a, a long time ago, I used to work for a company called PM Professional Learning, where we had one of these diagrams and we had all of the project management training and all of the different levels. And it, for a long time, it, that, there's not been one around. And we decided actually it would be really useful to do one from a PMO perspective. So PMO Learning has been set up because we want to deliver training and we want to deliver all of the certifications that are out there available for PMOs. So the three that we uh, deliver, which we believe are the only kind of accredited PMO courses out there. Um, first one is uh, the BCS certification. Okay, so the BCS have a PPSO certification that really covers off level one to three. Uh, the essentials course is absolutely perfect for coming straight into a PMO. Yes, you've never worked in projects and programs before, 
you want a job in a PMO, it's absolutely ideal. It talks to a bit about what project management is, and I'm sorry I'm using risk management, it's the one that comes to mind. It says this is what a risk register is, and actually this is how you would maintain a risk register. So really good entry level into a PMO. The advanced certificate talks about actually that wider piece about actually how to provide the justification, build the business case for your PMO. So that will, will help you and cover you from one to three. The P3O certification, and I have to have a uh, hold my hand up here as a kind of a, an interested party in P3O, having written the, uh, being the lead author for the refresh version that went out in 2013. Yes, get the nod, the guys on the right. So the P3O uh, certification looks on having a real understanding of why we're actually delivering the services that we're actually working on at the moment. So that's why it's really kind of working up from level two to level three. It covers off a bit of kind of how you, you cover off those services, but it's the real challenge around, I'm gonna sneeze, that's not good. For those of you who know my sneezes, you know that would not be a good thing. So uh, it, it starts off really at kind of level two, saying are we actually kind of, why are we delivering these services? Are they the right services for our organization? And when we get onto the uh, practitioner certificate, it's actually about going through that whole design process of putting together the right PMOs and the, the P3O structure across the organization. So that really kind of, again, takes us up into level three. And I've already asked somebody asked me today, why is that not the same level as the PPSO? And the PPSO one just has a, a broader view and, and more detail in terms of filling out the forms for the, for the business case. The final certification, which is really uh, where we start going into level four, is the new EIPMO certifications. And the EIPMO certifications is new to the UK. Now, not only does that kind of teach you the standards, what we want to do with the EIPMO certifications is make you think. Yes, so we say this is the standard, and you can learn the standard, but what's happening in three months' time? What's happening in six months' time? What's happening in 12 months' time? How does your service, how does your PMO, how does your organization, how are you going to continue to sort your organization by looking at that wider piece and actually being more proactive in designing what you do for your PMO. So hopefully by the time you've been through the self-assessment from your um, competency framework, you can identify which of the particular certifications is most appropriate for you and at the right level. And we're happy to provide you with some support from that. But career, um, career, Lindsay's now going to talk to you about what the outside world might think of where you're at and how best you can position yourself. And I'll sneeze down there, shall I? Um, anybody who, um, who knows Eileen and I will know that Eileen's very much the, the, the training and education person. And my background has been more around the uh, PMO recruitment and careers type stuff. Um, so I thought what would be quite nice uh, for the rest of this session was to actually pull some on that experience from, from my point of view uh, to give us a bit more of a rounded PMO career because it's yes, training and development is, is one part of it, but actually our jobs uh, obviously form a big part. Um, what we see in here is um, some of the early insights from the PMO benchmark report, which will be out uh, later on this year. Um, we essentially um, double up with Alice People, which is another business that I run but pull together PMO-specific insights, which is what we're going to look at here. So essentially, from a PMO point of view, what is it that organizations really look for is, quite obviously, PMO experience being the, the, the one, number one thing. Um, but also, it's important in terms of the personality and the style of that person and their approach. And the business experience and the education and the PM stroke PMO qualifications. Now, the way that this changes and differs from project managers, just as a, a slight insight, is that for where it's got business experience for PMO people, for project managers, that tends to be domain experience. It's where they're delivering projects. So, for example, if they're IT projects or 
uh, HR project. So the, it changes in terms of, from a PMO point of view, we're looking for PMO experience, but also business experience. And what we're talking about there are things like understanding the finance, for example, or the commercials and the legal and procurement aspects of a business. Yeah, so that's what we're, how it differs in terms of the project management role. Interestingly, when we looked at the training and development of, of PMO people, is that 87% of them have project management qualifications. And, of course, we know that from a PMO point of view, you do need to have your project management experience, your project management knowledge, program management, portfolio knowledge, that kind of thing. So you always have that in your arsenal, as it were, in terms of your development, that you do need to be looking at, at that aspect. But from a PMO point of view, what's becoming more and more common is that there's so many different types of PMOs, and so many of them needing um, extra uh, guidance and direction as to the different types of PMOs. But if you look at actually in terms of the main certification in PMOs today, only 21% of people have actually got their P3O. So actually a lot of their background and their education is purely around the project management side, but not really around PMOs and how they operate and the functions and services they provide and how they provide them. So, you know, this is obviously one of the things that Eileen and I have been doing over the last, well, since we've known each other for, for over a decade. Um, and what's been, if you think about how the organizations and this is what they're looking for, one of the things I've found from my recruitment background is that organizations find it incredibly difficult to find PMO people, good PMO people. And it's because of all these things coming into play. So when we talk about PMO experience, well, what is it that their organization's actually looking for? And often they find it quite difficult to articulate, well, this is the kind of PMO experience I want. This is the kind of services and functions we have. This is how we operate, and so on and so on. If you've been working in PMO, you kind of understand that. But if you think about it from a business point of view, often it's going through many cycles of a line manager wants a PMO person. That goes into HR. Then there's a recruitment team that get involved. And before you know it, there's a lot of filtering that goes on. And often the messages are mixed and lost in the translation between I need this PMO person within my, my team and then actually getting out there into the market and finding the people. So organizations do find it very difficult to find good people, which is one of the key drivers for me, being able to do the PMO competency framework as part of the PMO flash mob. From a recruitment point alone, it can really help us and help organizations to find the people that they need based on the different types of competencies that PMO people have. So one of the things, again, from my background in terms of the recruitment, and a lot of people have heard me talking about different things you can do in terms of making yourself stand out, things like the CVs, the profiles, the networking, all of that kind of good stuff. So I just thought I'd just do a really quick insights into some of the areas that the people have been talking about in terms of what organizations were looking for. So from a PMO experience point of view, one of the things that is really key for people working in PMOs is really understanding what your core competencies are, the functions and services that you provide, and how you provide them. It's a very different way of presenting what you do from than, than say, a project manager. Very different. So actually, when you see a lot of job advertisements out there and you look at what they're asking for in terms of the PM experience, you generally see that there's probably five things that you will always see. Things like the reporting, the planning, the risk issues change, all those kind of core things. And it's about being able to really represent and show, well, how do you do reporting? What level of reporting do you do? That kind of thing. So it's about how do we represent what we do, not only on our CV, but also when it comes to an interview, is how we've been able to articulate very clearly and concisely what it is that we're doing. Because it's ultimately, that is what an organization is looking for when they're hiring PMO. It's down into the nitty gritty of reporting or planning or risk or issues or change. When it comes to things like the education, of course we're biased. We're standing up here with a new business, part of you know a sister company to PMO Flashmob. Of course, it's important that there's some qualification, and you know we, we hear it all the time. Must have Prince Two. That does not apply to PMO world. It's great if you've got the Prince Two, but actually, in your world, does it really do anything to help you stand out? No. 
but actually it's some of the PMO related things, but also some of the other products from say Actlos. For example, the MOP is very popular with PMO people, as is the MOP, the, the uh, management of portfolios. So there are other options to um, explore that are actually probably more closely aligned with what you're doing in terms of the PMO work. And the business experience, it is about being able to have the, those kind of conversations and understanding that if you're working within a PMO, within a business, that you understand how your business, how your PMO is interacting with that business. So I think we've all got relationships with things like the finance department, for example. You know, what are our relationships like? How do we communicate and build relationships with each other? So there's the things that you're doing in person as well as obviously when you're actually trying to find a job, say, where you articulate this kind of stuff in your CV. So again, it's thinking as the wider thought. We've got our PMO experience, we've got our, our supporting, our understanding around projects, programs, and portfolios, but also recognizing that this PMO is within a business. That's what it's there for. Without that business, we wouldn't be there. So it's how do we demonstrate our understanding of the business world as well. It's a very business-focused role. Personality and style. It's another one of those things that it's difficult to get across in things like CVs, but actually using things like LinkedIn to your advantage allows you to put across messages like that in the interviewing stage and interviewing process. But often a lot of when it comes to recruitment and getting the job, a lot of it is down to the culture of that organization and whether your face fits and your style fits. So again, it's thinking about what is your style, what is your personality, what is your approach? Do you actually know? Can you really articulate and drive that through when you're delivering and talking about, I've got all this experience, I've got these qualifications, and this is how I get the job done? So there's these kind of things that you're thinking about that, that make up the whole PMO career type um, force. So over the years, I've been recruiting PMO people for 16 years. Having been a PMO manager myself and a PMO analyst before that, I had a pretty good idea about talking, um, you know, what, what makes a good PMO person. So we have all this stuff about, you know, um, lots of experience and knowledge and training and all that kind of good stuff. But when I think back over my last 16 years of some of the people that I've met along the way and what stood out for me, what I want to do is to share you five things that, that stood out to me. Now, it, and it's not necessarily about we've got a great qualification. It's a, a little bit more than that. So it's the confidence. When I'm talking to people for um, new opportunities, the confidence of that person comes through. Now, what we're talking about here is not about um, knowledge and experience built up through the job that we do. You know, there's a lot of people in this audience right now that have been working in this field for a long time. And perhaps like a lot of people, maybe not feeling so confident about what it is you're doing. And that can come from many different places. It can be about how your organization sees PMO, about where the PMO is pitched within the organization, when actually you're wanting to move on in your career and do fantastic things, but actually it's your organization that are holding you back in your ideas. Other things like imposter syndrome, I'm sure you've probably heard of that term, where you just feel like you're just winging it, you know. So the, from a confidence point of view, what we found is that we, there's a, a, almost like an a, a unintended consequence or something we didn't really think about, that PMO flash mobs actually help so many people to build, to, to build on their confidence because it does a number of things. It allows you to um, talk and interact with other people that work within your field. One of the problems that we often find is that we don't know how good we are. And you only know when you start to talk to other people and start to pitch yourself against other people. Whether you're doing it consciously or not, I think we all do it anyway. And I think flash mob has allowed people to um, have discussion and debate in an environment that is quite safe. You know, we're all PMO people and we know exactly what each of us is doing in our, in our jobs. There's no kind of... Um, picking on people or any of that kind of stuff. It's just really good to have those conversations and get it straight in your mind that actually our PMO is not as bad as I thought it was. And actually my skill sets are actually quite good. You know, so often that is the kind of thing that really comes through from really good candidates and really good PMO people is that, that confidence stuff. And it's not just about the technical ability to do the role, but yes, there's that behavioral stuff, the relationship building side of stuff. But the other conversations we've had along the way as well, when we talk about the confidence, are we talking about the fact that it's extrovert? No, we're not talking about introvert, extrovert. It's about having that quiet confidence in what it is that you're doing. 
and then that coming through in the job that you perform in. So it, you see it a lot, obviously, in terms of things like interviews, that people are able to talk um, about what they do quite clearly and quite concisely. And I think that's leading on to the second one, is that they can tell a story. And they have to. If you think about the job that a PMO does and all the people that it interacts with, being able to clearly and articulate what it is that you're doing. We hear so many stories from people where the PMO is getting kind of like overlooked at work because actually, uh, you know, it's just always there doing command and control type work and stopping us from doing stuff and all this kind of thing. And actually, it's such a really old fashioned view. And really, you should be telling them about. A, through story, but actually it can be different, and this is how we can do things, and PMO it delivers these functions and services, but it's doing it for the business, and this is how it changes and adds value to the business, and being able to show passion in what you're doing and how you're coming across with it, because I think one thing that it clearly shows is that when you've been working in a PMO that continuously gets beaten down, it starts to come over in the way that you're starting to deliver your, your, your services and your functions. It's almost a defeatism that we have to overcome. So in terms of being able to articulate what it is that we do to the, to the people that we're dealing with every day and being very conscious of, well, how do we get them on the side? How do we make sure that the data that we provide in our reports is fully understood, that they get it? You know? So it's, it's all of that kind of stuff where the people have really thought about. Actually, it's not good enough just to do the job. There's actually quite a lot more now about being able to, to bring people along with you. And I think part of that is about being able to be approaching and engaging, which generally, if you come along to a flash mob, you'll see that these PMO people are generally engaging and approaching, willing to share experiences and so on. And one of the things that we've, uh, we did at a project challenge, I think it was probably a year ago, was about um, seven highly effective habits of a PMO person. And uh, that is the, essentially the one that we continuously uh, bring up, is this fact that PMO really do need to be two ears and one mouth, and very good at not only telling the story, but listening and being able to play that back. So I really advise you, if you'd like to see more about it, Habits, which is a great presentation. It is available on the PMO Flash Mob website, and you can go and have a search for that. Now, I've got to move on a little bit because we're running over. But second thing, the, the fourth thing I'd say is that you never stop being curious because the whole interesting thing about this PMO malarkey is that there is so much for you to be doing and so much to get involved in. It's an amazing career. And if you are bored in PMO, there's something seriously wrong. And that could be that you're in the wrong place the wrong organization, or in the wrong type of PMO, or you just haven't met the people that are totally passionate about it and learn to get that positivity and that insight from other people. But being curious does mean things like taking continuous learning, and that's not just the formal learning, we're biased, we've got training courses, but this is about things like talking to other people within the PMOs, within the wider project management industry. What's going on? And how can we make our businesses better? Stop being curious and you might as well be dead. The other thing that I see from people is that they have a very considered career. And that is not about being able to plan to the nth degree what they're going to do with their life. But it is about being thinking about, actually, I'm, I'm ready to move on. I feel like I've learned everything. I know I'm in a comfort zone here. I think now's the time to, to go on and look for a different opportunity. It's knowing when it, time is right to be trying new things. Knowing that actually where you're working at the moment, you may never get the opportunity to be working at a portfolio level, but you really want to get that skill set. It's knowing that actually sometimes it's time is, is, is right to change if you listen to all these wonderful things. I mean, we see it a lot in flash mob that people do change their jobs, probably more frequently than if they didn't go, because they're hearing what other people are getting involved in and think, actually, I quite like a bit of that as well. So it's having a considered a career approach rather than just letting opportunity come to you or not, and thinking, you know what, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to get that, because I want that. And the other thing I'd say is about being... Um, the lo a lot more of the people we've met through Flashmore, but the people that are willing to, I want to get involved, I want to do something. Um, it's not just a job. And, and it'll always be the few rather than the many. But actually, there are opportunities to get involved because 
what we're finding is that there's so many things through the um, AI PMO stuff that we're doing that research is still going on. PMO is still very, um, you know, not widely understood. There's a lot of work to do. And you think, well, would we rather it happen to us or do we want to get involved with it and help to shape our industry going forward? And what we see is, um, you know, it's about the, the chicken and the, and the pig being invited for breakfast. You're involved like the chicken or you're committed like the pig. Um, so there's a, a thing here about being able to share what you've got and want to be able to help others. And that's essentially about just giving back. So running out of time, you probably haven't got time for questions either, but um, if you'd like to know anything more about PMO learning in terms of the qualifications, um, website address there, PMO flash mob, pmoflashmob.org, if you'd like to see some of the, all the stuff that we've been doing over the last four or five years, lots of video sessions, lots to get you fired up and passionate about. Um, we're still over on the stand near the exit, so don't think you can give us a, a, a wide swerve when you leave. Come and pick up some of the stuff there, get your stickers, show people that you care about what it is that you're doing. And um, thank you very much. Thank you.